Good morning. Beautiful day, right? Um, Today's scripture is from the Gospel of John, chapter 20, verses 19 to 31. It's a familiar uh, account for a lot of us. Um, But I would ask that as you hear it and as as we talk about it today, that you would kind of give some fresh eyes to it and kind of allow God to move. Maybe there's something... It's not just like, yeah, I know, Doubting Thomas, yeah, yeah. Um, But just allow God to come in, and maybe he's got something for you today. I believe that to be true. This is the Gospel of John, chapter 20, verses 19 to 31. It says, On the evening of the first day of the week, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and he stood among them. He said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side, and the disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. And again, Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sin, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Now Thomas, also known as Didymus, was one of the twelve was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the nail marks in his hands, and I put my finger where the nails were, and I put my hand in the side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. And though the doors were locked, and Jesus came, and he stood among them, and he said, Peace be with you. And then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here. See my hands? Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. And then Jesus told him, Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of of the disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing that you may have life in his name. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray. God, thank you for your word today. Thank you that it touches our hearts in surprising ways. Um, Thank you for the truth of what has happened for this Easter, that you've risen again, that you have conquered sin that you've defeated death, that you um, restore and and replenish us. And God, I pray for your wholeness today. I pray that we would see you um, more, that when we leave here, we would love you more than we did when we walked in, that we would even trust you a little bit more, that we would um, just know you and love you. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Now today, um, we're going to focus, I said, on on the portion of scripture dealing with Thomas's encounter with the resurrected Christ. And here's the question that I've been asking myself the last couple weeks as as I've been looking at this at this passage. And it's a pretty simple question. It's probably one that most people ask when they're studying anything. But the question is, why is this here? Why is this account included? And the reason I ask that is because there's got to be a good and compelling reason um, that John included this. Because as, as I say in John, and we read in John 31, verse 31, that John wrote this book that we might believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and in so doing, that we might have life. And so it's important, he, he, I'm sure he was like pretty persnickety about what he picked and what he didn't pick. Because he even says, there's so many things that could be written. So John wrote the account with his hopes of compelling people, of compelling you to believe in Jesus. He's very discriminate about the accounts that he included, and I say this for a few reasons. One is that what scholars say is that the book of John includes literally 20, maybe 22 days of the life of Christ, depending on the way you read it. So it's not a large, like he's, he's not trying to cover the whole thing. He's covering a short amount of time, and in verse um, Chapter 21, verse 25, the last verse of his gospel, it says, Jesus did many other things as well. If every one of them were written down, I suppose that, I suppose that even the whole world would not have room for the books that, it would, that would be written. I mean, there's a ton of stuff. There's tons and tons of things that you could write about. 
But he didn't write about all those. He picked certain ones. And the question is, why this one? Why this one? Because, you know, this account is not found in any of the other Gospels. It's only found in John. And so you've got to wonder, why, why this account? And, you know, Luke kind of gives a nod to it a little bit. He kind of talks about the general, kind of the sketch of it. But he doesn't talk about specifically about Thomas. So why is this included? Why, why does John think this is so important? So we're going to dig into that today. I'm not going to answer the question until the end. Dun, dun, dun. Um, so just to summarize, I know you already know this. We just read it. But here's what's going on. Jesus was crucified on Friday. The disciples are together in a room. Uh, the doors are locked and they're afraid. And which I get, frankly. I get that. Um, and they're afraid and they kind of don't know what to do. And the resurrected Jesus appears to them. And he shows them his hand and he shows them his side. And the disciples are overjoyed and he gives them the Holy Spirit and he um, commissions them to go. Now, Thomas wasn't there. Why wasn't Thomas there? I don't know. And frankly, nobody knows, because I've read a lot of commentaries, and nobody knows why Thomas wasn't there, but he wasn't. And so when Thomas comes back, they say, Thomas, we've seen the Lord. And he says, really? Because in order for me to believe, I'm not only going to need to see him, but I want to see the hole. I want to see sunlight through the hole in his hand, and I want to put my finger there. And I want to put my hand in his side and feel around for his appendix. Like, that's kind of what, you know, he's kind of saying, like, not only do I need to see it, but I want to touch it. I want to know it. I want to know that it's true. Like, oh, okay. Seems a little like, you know, all right. But because of that, because of that very thing, we know Thomas as what? What do we know him as? Doubting, doubting Thomas. Everybody knows doubting Thomas. I got to see it to believe it. Now, um, again, I, what I try and do when I'm, when I'm studying or thinking about a scripture is I try and step back from what I usually, you know how like when you read scripture, a lot of times you kind of play it in your head and you see it as it goes and you kind of think this is what's happening and, you know, I try and step back from that and see what, what it actually says, you know, because sometimes you're surprised at what you think versus what's actually in there. And so in doing that, I realize that I personally think that Thomas got a bad rap on the whole doubting thing. Because no one else believed until they saw it either. But he had to say it. But no one else believed. So I'm like, the poor guy gets the rap of being the one guy. Like, really, would, he, would you have reacted any differently than he did? Really? I mean, this is something no one's ever even thought of, can, could even imagine in their brain that somebody would come back from the dead and live again. This was before zombies were even thought of. I mean, the, do you know what I'm saying? Like, it's like, what? I just... It's something that's so, you can't get your head around it. I want to believe it, but I have nothing to compare that with. I have nothing to compare that with. So he didn't really respond any differently than you or I did. And frankly, he didn't respond any differently than the disciples did. Because in Luke, it says this, verses, um, chapter 24, verses 9 to 12 says, when they came back from the tomb, this is talking about the women, they told all these things to the leaven and to all the others. It was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary, the mother of James, and the others with them who told this to the apostles. But they did not believe the women because their words seemed to them like nonsense. Okay? So Peter, now this it gets better. Peter, however, got up and he ran to the tomb. And bending over, he saw the strips of linen lying there by themselves. And he went in, wondering to himself what had happened. Well, they just told you what happened but you didn't believe. Like the 11, they didn't believe either until Jesus showed up. Jesus showed up in a room where there was locked doors and they were afraid and he's standing there. They're like, okay, now I believe. Now I get it. So I think personally that Thomas got a bad rap on that one. But they too needed empirical proof. And yes, Thomas was doubting, but I think they all were. And aren't we all doubting at some point? Don't we all doubt? Have you struggled with doubts on God this month, this week, this morning? Have you? I think those of us who are followers of Jesus can sometimes think that it's bad, it's even wrong to doubt God. I mean, it makes sense that those that are outside the faith, the Christian faith, they might have doubts. But believe it or not, those inside the faith 
experience doubt as well. I mean, these are disciples of Jesus, and they doubted. So I don't know. I mean, they were the closest people to Jesus. They experienced all the things, and they still had doubt. Why do we think we would be any different? Why would we think we would be any different? These are the closest companions. These are, some of these people even wrote scripture. I don't even have a goal to write scripture. That's not even in my five-year plan. Like, I don't, even, you know, I don't even attain to that. That's not even something I think that I could do. My goals are realistic. But these are people who wrote scripture, and they had doubts as well. So we all encounter doubt. And some even say that we can't actually grow without it. We need to test what we believe. I want to talk just a little bit about living in the Saturday. And this is what I mean by that. John Ortberg talks about this a little bit, and it struck me as relevant to this. And um, there's a Friday, right? There's Friday when the unthinkable happens, right? Jesus is crucified. Then there's Sunday. There's Sunday when the resurrection happens. There's restoration. But there's also this day in the middle. There's Saturday. And Saturday is when it seems nothing happens. Nothing happens. A whole lot of silence. That's what happens. Nothing. And so for Friday, the the disciples, Jesus was crucified. Their hopes, their dreams, everything they had staked their lives on was gone. Jesus is not going to be the king. Jesus is not going to restore them. He's not the Messiah. The horrible reality is Jesus is dead. Jesus failed. That's Friday. For us, maybe it's our business is failing, our marriage is in trouble, our children are struggling. You lose your job, you lose your friend, you lose your health, and it's on Friday. On Friday, there's dying. On Sunday, for the disciples, Sunday is the day believers say, gave birth to the most death-defying, grave-defeating, fear-destroying, sin-crushing, hope-inspiring, transcendent joy in the history of the world. Jesus rose again. For us, maybe your marriage is on track, your children are thriving, your job is secure, you're feeling fulfilled, your relationships are restored. On Sunday, there's, there's restoration. On the first day, there's trouble. On the third day, there's deliverance. On the second day, there's nothing. There's continuance of trouble. There's silence. There's doubt. Now, 11 disciples lived there for one day. Jesus died. They lived on the Saturday. The confusion, the doubt. Jesus came to him on Sunday. For Thomas, he lived there one week longer. He lived there one week longer. And you and I, we live there for weeks and months, hopefully days, but weeks and months. And the problem with the third day story is you don't know it's a third day story until the third day. Because you're just, you're living in it. And it's there, and that's the reality. And what you do is in your head, you're trying to get your head and your heart to all line up and say, even though everything I see around me says this, this is what I know to be true. This is what I know to be true. That is a hard battle to fight. That is a hard battle to fight sometimes. When it's Friday, when it's Saturday, as far as you know, deliverance is never going to come. It may be a one-day story, a one-day story that lasts the rest of your life. Am I exaggerating or does it feel like that sometimes? And this is usually where doubt incubates. This is usually where doubt is born. What is doubt? You know, I, um, I suffer from vertigo, and they call it positional vertigo, which means it could happen anytime, anywhere, who knows. But um, for me, basically, what happens is if I look straight up, I fall over, okay? So this is really easy to deal with because you just don't look straight up, right? So it's like, you know, I can deal with that. I, like, you don't reach for a high shelf to grab something off a high shelf. Now, I shouldn't anyway because I'm very short. But either way, like, I don't look straight up because I'll fall over. Um, and the other thing is that there's nightlights in my entire house because in the dark, 
I literally can't tell which side's up, and I fall over. I fall over. And so a doubt, a doubt is a little bit like spiritual vertigo. When your eye gives your brain something that it can't seem to process, and it's kind of like your footing is a little off, and you kind of can't get your balance, and everything seems to be a little off, because what you're seeing isn't lining up with what you know to be true, and so it just takes you off kilter. Does that make sense? So it's like spiritual vertigo. There's something that you see that your heart seemed to not be able to process. I thought God was good, but now I'm experiencing this. I'm feeling this pain. I'm feeling this suffering. I don't know what to do with that. What, what, I, know, I do know in my head what's true about God, but my reality is screaming at me that something is different than that, that something's different than that. So we live in a lot of Saturdays, would you agree? Also, though, on Saturday, this is where Jesus comes in. This is where Jesus shows up. And he says, here's my hand. Here's my hand. Touch it. Here's my side. Put your hand in here. Go ahead. Go ahead. He knew exactly what Thomas needed at that moment. I mean, this is just a a side, but Jesus didn't come, um, you know, on the Resurrection Sunday, meet the 11 11 guys and like, hey, you're back, this is awesome, and then tell Thomas, and Thomas is like, no, I don't believe it, and then on Wednesday, Jesus comes back and meets with Peter, and Peter's like, hey, Jesus, Thomas doesn't believe. Like, because you gotta wonder, like, how how does Jesus know that that's exactly what Thomas needed? Well, he's God, there's that. You know, I mean, I'm like, but I'm not kidding. Like, you got to, Thomas has got to be going like, wait, what? How did you, what? How do you know? D- Thomas, touch my hand. Here it is. Touch it right here. He invites him to come test it. Touch me. Trust me. If it was wrong for Thomas to doubt in this way, why would Jesus have come and showed him his hand and invited him to touch it? You know, I always, I I do, sometimes I feel like, oh, I shouldn't be doubting, this is wrong. I I just want, you know, I want God to show up and do it. And you're like, yeah, I do. Because you know what? I know he can. He defeated death. He conquered sin. He can deal with my messed up life. He can. He can. He loves me. Do you know how, I still haven't gotten the whole grasp of that one. I still, I really haven't. God loves me. He cares about that piece. He does. Jesus shows up in our darkest moments and and he, he says, touch me. Test it. Trust me. See right here, see? Are you reaching out? To Jesus, in the midst of your struggle, in the midst of your doubt, please don't hide in your own head and try and talk yourself out of it. You need to go to Jesus and say, Jesus, right now, I don't get this. I don't get it. This doesn't make sense to me. You, I know you to be like this, but I am feeling like this right now. I'm choosing to trust in you. But wow, this is hard. This is hard. If you're not reaching out to him, what? why are you not reaching out? What is holding you back? Jesus is basically saying, come on. Try me. Try me. You know, when I was um, on Young Life staff uh, a couple years ago, I had the privilege of speaking at camp a few times. And one year I was at Lake Champion. And what I love about Lake Champion is there's a lake. And there's a lake full of fish. And um, on, uh, so, I, so I would go, and for seven days at a time, I would speak to 400, 500 kids, and I would go through and walk them through the gospel. On day three, we talked about sin and our brokenness and our separation from God. That was always fun. And um, I actually, most people didn't like it. I loved it because I think it explains so much about what they're experiencing. But anyway, that's aside. Um, so on night three, we would talk about sin. And then we, I had like a gap of about an hour, an hour and 15 minutes where I didn't have to be at anything. They went to a square dance and I didn't have to necessarily have to 
participate in square dance. So I would walk out the door and I would fish. And I'd have my overalls on and my buck teeth for the hoedown, but I was fishing. I was ready. I was going to fish till the last minute. And every once in a while, you know, I, I would love to say that the hope was that somebody would come by and we'd have some deep conversation, but really it was like, it was dusk and it was perfect time for fishing and I love to fish. So, you know, I'm fishing and um, one week a, a little girl comes by and she couldn't have been more adorable. She must have been 16 years old, but she was just this little, I just wanted to like put her in a locket and carry her around with me. She's so cute. And um, so she comes by and she comes up and she stands next to me, doesn't say a word. And I'm fishing and I'm like, so I just kind of wait. I'm thinking, I don't know. So I wait. And um, she doesn't say anything, so I'm like, hey. <laughs> you know? And uh, she's like, hey. And I was like, hey, where are you from? So I'm just trying to get to know her a little bit and all that stuff, you know. And so finally I say, um, so how are you enjoying the week so far? And I, I tend to do that because I, I want them to know that they should be enjoying the week. So how are you enjoying the week so far? <laughs> and um, she's like, oh, it's been good so far. She's like, I don't believe one word you're saying. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so I just, well, I don't know, okay. So, um, and I was like, really? And she's like, yeah. I was like, well, you don't believe me like I'm telling a lie or you don't believe the things that I'm telling you? I don't believe what you're telling me. Okay, so is there, like, what's going on? Like, what's going on in your past? Or we're just talking about stuff, right? She goes, listen, I don't believe that there is a God and I don't believe that um, if there was a God that he would care about me. I don't believe that there was something that made this whole world. I don't think there's anything that cares that I'm right here and that my, I got kicked off the team and I don't think that there's anyone out there that cares about that. I was like, huh. So um, I said, this is profound. I said, have you ever fished before? <laughs> and, uh, and yeah, I was stalling. But she, I did ask, have you ever fished before? She's like, no. I was like, you never caught a fish? She's like, no. You want to try? She said, sure. OK. So I, give her, I teach her how to do this. I'm, you know, I'm not really stalling, but I am trying to engage her. You know? So she's, now she's fishing. And I said, you know what? I get that you, don't, that you don't get it. And I get that you don't believe that maybe it's true. And here's what I would say to you, as your friend and as a person who does care about you, I would say this, tell him. You know what the best thing to do is say, Jesus, you know what, I don't think you're true. I don't think you exist. I don't think you're alive and I don't think you care. Prove me wrong. And then wait, you have to be open though, watch. Watch God. Now you know there's this part that says don't test the Lord, right? And I'm not saying that you're, you know, hear what I'm saying. But she's doubting. She's like, I don't even think God exists. I don't think he cares about me. I don't think, even if he did exist, he wouldn't care about me. I was like, test him. I dare you. I dare you to say, God, I don't think you're around. I don't think you care about me. I don't think you exist. I don't think you built all this. And I don't, I don't think you want anything to do with us. And then wait and watch. I was like, would, would you do that? She's like, yeah, I'll do it. I said, no, you can't do it like that. You can't do it like that. You have to wholeheartedly do it. You have to say, God, I don't think it. And then you have to watch and wait and see what God does. She's like, oh, okay. So she, she goes off. I have no idea what happened to this girl, but I will say this. At the end of the week, we usually do a say-so where kids can stand up and say if they've made a commitment to Christ or not. She did not stand up. She up, came up to me afterwards, and she said, is, I would never forget it, because she said, hey, I don't know if what you're saying is true, but I'm going to jump in there, and I'm going to figure it out. I'm going to test him, and I'm going to try him. And I said, I dare you to do that, because you know what? He is faithful. He is faithful. He did resurrect from the dead. He does conquer our sin. He does restore us to wholeness. This is true. I know this is true. I don't know where this girl is today. I'm confident that she has encountered Christ in some way. Because that's what he does. That's what he came for. That's what Sunday's about. A lot of life is lived in, in the Saturday, but that's what Sunday's about. And when Thomas, get, Thomas gets through with his doubts, he says, my Lord and my God. And most commentators say that that is the loftiest, the most direct the highest confession of faith in all of the Gospels by a human being. Okay, so here's the greatest doubter, and now he's become the greatest believer. The Greek translation of Lord and God here is um, a person who exercises absolute ownership rights, the creator and the owner of all things. And he's saying, you are my Lord, you are my God. 
He gives the highest confession of faith. And that's why I think this passage belongs right here in John. Because the greatest doubter gave the greatest expression of belief and faith. And that is the gospel. That is the gospel. Even when the weak and broken, the doubting, the lonely, the lost person, even those people, they can be transformed by the life and the death and the resurrection power of the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus holds out his hands and he says, touch me. He is able. He is willing. And he's right here. Let me pray. God, thank you that your word encourages us. Thank you that your word, that you put things in the scripture to challenge us, to help us to know you more, to see you more clearly, to love you more deeply. So God, I pray today that we would, if we're holding back, that we would reach out and we would touch you in the places that are the most painful for us, that we would say we would trust you in that. Say, Jesus, we ask that you show up, and we pray this in the name of Jesus.